morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Ask the Theologian. I'm Dr. Randy White and delighted that you have joined us on this Tuesday. We missed you yesterday, President's Day, and I was on the road a little bit and uh, glad to be back on the desk today and taking your biblical, theological, and worldview questions over the weekend. The president was in trouble with the Democrats. Can you imagine that? And uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, how dare he influence the Department of Justice. There should be a wall of separation between the Department of Justice and the President of the United States. Seems to be the common opinion of the land. The president should not influence the Department of Justice. Of course, remember the Department of Justice is the FBI and all those kind of uh, uh, research uh, and law enforcement organizations. But I would just remind you that the Department of Justice is part of the executive branch, and the president is the executive. This means that the executive branch is over the Department of Justice. This means that just as the president is uh, over the, uh, the, the armed forces, he's over the police forces of the federal government. That would be the FBI and uh, those uh, various organizations like that, ATF and you name them. So the president is the executive. Now, if the president cannot influence, let's say, the Department of Defense, then who does? Ah, he does influence the Department of Defense, the Department of Education, the Department of Homeland Security. All these things are under his purview because he is the executive. The same goes for the Department of Justice. And if the president doesn't give this influence, who does? What happens under this fake scenario that uh, the Democrats are putting together? And it's a fake scenario because they, uh, they didn't have the same and don't and will not whenever, <coughs> God forbid, there's one of their uh, in their party that is in the White House. They don't have the same kind of uh, scenario there. But this, uh, this uh, fake principle here that there's supposed to be this separation, that he's not supposed to comment about what's going on, that he's not supposed to give any kind of influence. If the president doesn't give influence to the Department of Justice, who does? Certainly not the Congress by the Constitution. It's certainly not the Supreme Court uh, by the Constitution. So what happens? they are effectively making the Department of Justice into a fourth branch of government. That is, not by the Constitution, but by these uh, fake, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, protocols that they're trying to bring about. They're trying to make, for now, not after they win an election, but just for now, because they're two-faced, they want the Department of Justice to be a fourth branch of government. Now, Congress has the power to subpoena. They can do that. Congress has the power to impeach. They can do that. Congress has the power to investigate. They can do that. I would say, if there are any congressmen listening, do your job and just your job. Don't try to do the president's job. By the way, I think the vast majority of Americans agree with me that Congress hasn't done its job in a long, long time. Congress is just constantly bickering, whining, and bewailing the fact that some blah, 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 and never doing their job. So you just do your job. Let the president do his job. The Supreme Court has the, uh, the opportunity to rule something unconstitutional. So we've got checks and balances already. Now, every president influences the Department of Justice and can influence the Department of Justice and, might I say, should influence the Department of Justice. The problem is the Department of Justice, for large, in, large, in many ways, it has become a cesspool. And the reason that the Democrats don't like President uh, Trump's influence on the Department of Justice is because they have embedded within the Department of Justice their sleeper cells, their terrorist sleeper cells. The deep state is deeply embedded in the Department of Justice. I think that's very dangerous. I think we need a president 
who tweets about it, who speaks up about it, who constantly is telling us you shouldn't trust what's going on over there and what has going on over there. So, President Trump, God bless you. Tweet some more. That's my comment. I'm Dr. Randy White, and uh, delighted that you've joined us for, oops, there we go, uh, uh, sorry about that, for your biblical, theological, and worldview questions. Uh, for those of you on our uh, chat box, you might uh, note that uh, we are, um, uh, we've made some improvements over the weekend uh, to uh, the uh, chat box and uh, all you have to do is uh, go to our website and then right there, ask the theologian, see where it says click for more right there. Uh, you can just click that for more. And uh, there you've got uh, the, uh, the, the chats that are going on right there. It happens to be that your chats, like mine here, will be in black so that you can easily find those. Questions come out in blue and uh, everybody else's chat uh, comes out uh, like uh, just like it is right there. And uh, very helpful. You say, well, that's too small. Or maybe you want to be watching the video here in full screen, which you can uh, do via YouTube is the feed that comes through there. Now we've got this pop out button right there. And uh, you can just click pop out. It'll open up a new window. And uh, there you've got it all right there. And... Uh, that saves you, by the way. I think we already had a question come in on YouTube that uh, took uh, three, uh, what do you call it, three little chats to fit because YouTube's limited in what it does. We don't limit you like that. We want your long questions. You can fit the whole thing right there. And uh, we're, we're monitoring them all uh, and uh, taking all of uh, your questions. Uh, but, uh, and I watch your comments on the chat box there, there, our chat box, like Greg, who says the Congress being two-faced, how could that possibly be? Uh, and they, and they always show their ugly face too. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Uh, now, uh, let's uh, get right into your questions after one more bit of business, and that is to say this good book right here uh, is our special of the week at Dispensational Publishing House, uh, Dispensationalism Before Darby. Let me tell you that I'm not even sure you can find a copy of this right now. Uh, I think that uh, if you can, it's probably going to be very expensive. So, hey, those of you who are... Uh, uh, wise, you might want to go to dispensationalpublishing.com, use coupon code Wednesday. I think it's already up on the website, uh, even on this Tuesday. And you can get this 30% off. It's regular $24.95 and uh, save 30% when you use coupon code Wednesday. That's good. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, probably into Friday. And uh, we will uh, be happy to uh, send that to you. Have them in stock and ready to go. A question from Bill in Cyprus that uh, begins our uh, questions today on this uh, Tuesday, which is the first day of our week due to President's Day. So I thought I'd uh, begin the broadcast talking a little bit about the president. But uh, let's look to Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and uh, 29, where Bill's question, does Romans 2, 28 and 29 teach a spiritual Israel? He says, I don't think it does. How important it is that we, the body of Christ, get this right. Now, I, uh, first of all, let me uh, say I, I completely agree, and I, I want to make sure everyone else understands this per step, per, blah, 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 perspective here, that the body of Christ is not Israel, nor is the body of Christ a spiritual Israel. The body of Christ is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is, we might call it the church, that's a little bit of a loose term. Body of Christ is a little more refined, and I think that's the, uh, the best term to use here. But they're separated. But there are many who teach that Romans 2, 28 and 29, leads to or teaches about a spiritual Israel. Romans 2, 28, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not of the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now, you can see how those who 
especially when they've already got their preconceived agenda, which is a very dangerous thing to bring into the Word of God. This is why we uh, question the assumptions here, our own assumptions. If you're already thinking we're the new Jerusalem or we're the new Israel, we're the spiritual Israel, or use the words of Paul in Galatians, we're the Israel of God. If you already have that in your mind, then you can come and make this to be a defense of that. Once again, he's not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but a Jew, which is one inwardly. Oh, I am a Jew inwardly. I am a Jew in the heart. I think of those uh, words of uh, uh, John F. Kennedy. Well, uh, I'm not good at my German, but I, Ich bin Berliner. Was that uh, it? Did I get somewhere close in that? Anyway, you know what I'm talking about if you're my age or older. And, uh, uh, you know, we're all Berliners. That's what it is. Uh, well, uh, does this passage of Scripture say that about Jews? Does it say that we, the Christians, are the real Jews? I think when you look at this closely, you see, first of all, that in uh, chapter uh, 2, as we uh, look to uh, chapter 2, I don't know if we uh, come up uh, to the uh, beginning uh, in through chapter 2, I believe that we're going to see that the context here is that Paul is one who is, excuse me, he is uh, speaking to the Jewish people in chapter 2. We see, for example, in verse uh, 14, for when the Gentiles, which do not have the, here he's talking to the Jews, he says, okay, let me talk about the uh, Gentiles here. And he's here, the context, uh, behold, thou art called a Jew and rest us in the law and make us boast of God. Okay, he's talking to Jewish people. And what Paul is doing is explaining to them uh, here in this part, overall in Romans, he's explaining what God is doing in the mystery. But here in this section in chapter 2, he is explaining that along with the works of the law, there were always the, there was always the need to bring some faith into it. You could not just come in in a perfunctory manner, go through the uh, aspects, the checklist of the law. And so he comes then and says in verse 28, he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. He says, yeah, okay. You can outwardly uh, have the circumcision, check off the things of the law. You can do all of that. But as he says in another place in the book, not all of Israel is Israel. And therefore, what he's saying is, hey, it's not the entire nation of Israel, which is the remnant, if I can use that word. It's not the entire nation of Israel, which is right with God, but only Israel, which is, uh, is, is uh, one who has, in verse 29, a Jew inwardly, a circumcision of the heart in the spirit. Now, it goes back, he gives that idea of the circumcision of the heart or the circumcision of the flesh. That goes back to Jeremiah chapter 30, 31, where it talks about the new covenant. Basically, what it says is the Israel of God or the Israel that is going to be saved is not every Jew who ever lived, but rather it is those upon whom God gives them a new heart, the Jews which God gives them a new heart, the, the, the remnant of the Jews, if you will. So, um, you know, King Herod, in one sense, was a Jew. It was, uh, he was converted into Judaism uh, and never uh, carried out his Judaism. But yeah, King Herod was a Jew outwardly. Was he a Jew? No. Now, does this say, I think this, this passage of Scripture suffers from people making this passage say what it doesn't say. Does this say that Gentiles who are, in verse uh, 29, Gentiles which are, which are Jews inwardly, or Gentiles which have a circumcision that is of the heart, Gentiles which don't follow Judaism by the letter, uh, but uh, God praises them, that they're Jews. No, it doesn't actually say this. If you consider some uh, Venn diagrams, I suppose. You've got a, a, a circle here that uh, includes, you know, everybody who is a descendant of Abraham. 
And then of those, you would uh, circle within within that. If I had a, a ability to draw here, I would do so. But uh, you got a big circle. Then within that, you've got maybe two small circles, descendants of Abraham. You would have uh, the Ishmaelites, and you would have the, uh, the the descendants of Isaac. And then of the descendants of Isaac, you could draw two more circles. And within those circles, you've got the descendants of Esau, and you've got the descendants of of uh, Jacob. And so what you see here is, if, if I can use the words in a different way, not all who are of Abraham are of Israel. Now of Israel, he goes in, and if you will, he's got two more circles, and there he says, those who are just Jews outwardly and those who are Jews inwardly. Now, what he's saying is this little circle right here, of all of this potentiality, this little circle right here is the remnant. That's the ones who, uh, uh, to, to whom are the recipients of the promise. Now, what does that say about somebody totally outside even of that big circle? That would be me because I am not a descendant of Abraham at all. The truth is what it says about this person over here is absolutely nothing. So the logic of saying he who uh, is a Jew outwardly is not the real Jew, but only one who's a Jew inwardly. That The, the logic of saying, therefore, the Chinese guy who uh, has a circumcision of the heart, he's a Jew. I don't think that, uh, I, I think the, uh, the, the, the logic simply uh, does not follow there uh, and uh, doesn't, uh, d- doesn't carry through there. So I think he's saying, hey, even if you're Jewish, You can't uh, uh, celebrate uh, all that uh, is yours. You've got to come into the new covenant. You've got to have this circumcision of the heart that takes place uh, and uh, speaks of that uh, which is uh, coming later. So uh, thank you, Bill, for uh, that question. I appreciate uh, that. And we have a uh, question that uh, comes in from our friend Corey, who sits right over here. Uh, And uh, the question is uh, Jude, uh, verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3, only one chapter in it. And uh, Corey is the student at the Taos Theological Seminary, but we'll take some more. And uh, he is uh, doing a little study of the book of Jude, and so he came upon a question. It's a good one. Uh, Beloved, verse 3, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write to you and exhort to you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered for the saints. Now, Corey's question is, in Jude, verse 3, is the common salvation a reference to the salvation message uh, to the Gentiles Uh, and the faith once delivered a reference to the kingdom message. What he's asking is, do we have two gospels in Jude uh, verse 3? I think we do. Uh, Now, uh, am I not mistaken that Bullinger uh, puts Jude at a very early date? Is that right? Uh, In the the 40s. Okay. Uh, if If Bullinger is right, then I'm wrong. Uh, Bollinger puts it pre-mystery. And therefore, Bollinger would have to say, I don't know that he's got a commentary on it that says, but Bollinger would have to say in verse 3 that the common salvation is the same one that was delivered unto the saints. And the reason he'd have to say that is because the mystery salvation did not come about. Now, Bollinger... Uh, I think is brilliant and don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But I think we question the assumptions on Bollinger. I don't think he got everything completely right there. And uh, I think that I'm going to put Jude later. And Jude is of the understanding of the mystery. Now, my interpretation of it would be in verse 3 that uh, Jude comes and he says, I gave all diligence to write to you of the common salvation. The word I believe there is koine, let's see, 
uh, konos, yes, uh, the uh, common uh, koinonia, see what the footnote uh, says here, goes to Titus chapter 1, verse 4. Okay, the common salvation. What's the common salvation? I would interpret that to say the salvation that is common to both Jews and Gentiles. That is Paul's mystery gospel, the gospel of grace. It's common, neither Jew nor Gentile, uh, slave nor free, male nor female. It's common to everyone. Uh, and that's what he wanted to write about. But then he goes on to say, it was needful for me to write to you and exhort that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered for the saints. It looks to me like I wanted to write about the common salvation. I gave all diligence to write to you about the common salvation, but I didn't write about that because it was needful for me to, to write and exhort that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto all the saints. So we've got... Uh, a, uh, a, a, a matter here that uh, he, he had to. It was needful right here. Uh, uh, the, the, um, I, basically, it, it means, as it's translated in the Newberry Interlinear, I had to. So I wanted to, I had to. You, you've had that uh, kind of scenario before, didn't you? This is what I wanted to do. This is what I had to do. So he wanted to write about the gospel of grace, but there was a need to write about the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That is, it was delivered to the holy ones. That is, it was delivered to Israel. And he wanted them to contend for that faith. Now, this gives credence to that, uh, that which I teach often, that the gospel of the kingdom overlapped with the gospel of grace. He wanted to write about the gospel of grace, but in the context of Jude, this gospel of the kingdom was about to come to a completion when the nation of Israel would be destroyed. And so kind of like the book of Hebrews, he is warning the uh, Jewish people that their offer of the kingdom is about to be put into abeyance completely until the end of time. And so they needed to earnestly contend for the faith. Now, does this mean they could be, could have an individual salvation uh, for, uh, by the kingdom gospel? No, it didn't mean that. Did this mean the kingdom gospel was going to go on forever? No, it didn't mean that. It meant that there was a time of urgency in which they needed to contend, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, if I'm right, and here's a homework assignment for Corey in the Taos Theological Seminary. If I'm right in this, uh, then the book should play itself out in that regard. The book should not be arguing that, that uh, there be an earnest contention for the Pauline gospel, but rather it should have a very Jewish flavor which says that the Jewish people need to rise up and defend their, uh, the, the faith delivered unto the saints, that is this opportunity of the kingdom gospel that has been delivered to them, that they need to, as a nation, repent and be baptized. So I would uh, say that uh, probably here we have got uh, a, uh, a, a matter in which, uh, trying to look at some of the Greek here while I'm doing this, uh, we've got a matter in which they are uh, instructed to stand for Peter's gospel because that is what is going to save the nation. It's not going to save you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry, it's going to save the nation. And that is exactly uh, what uh, they should do in uh, carrying that out. Uh, so he writes to uh, these Jewish people and he is exhorting uh, you. Uh, and that's what I thought. We've got uh, here, in looking at the Greek, uh, write to you uh, and uh, get over here to the English, uh, write unto you that ye should. Ye is supplied here, but properly so. 
Uh, you, by the way, is a direct object. Ye is a uh, subject. Uh, so uh, to write unto you that ye should earnestly contend. Now, remember when you have the ye, you've got the ye plural, ye singular rule. Uh, if, if ye goes with the singular, he's asking them to do this as a group. And that's what you've uh, got uh, here, right here. The verb, uh, uh, the the uh, subject type verb, is a singular exhorting uh, that uh, you should contend. So this is the word right here that we're looking at is the singular that uh, exhorting uh, in the singular you in the in the uh, uh, which is a second person plural automatically. Uh, so you've got the you pronoun with a singular verb that's saying, I want the nation to do this. I am exhorting the nation to uh, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Uh, and uh, so carry that out. and Let's uh, see if that comes to fruition. That indeed, that is what you come up with. Let me, let me uh, say just a little word here that... I've said a number of times before, but I think it is perfectly acceptable and very helpful to study a book with an assumption going into it. I know there is, you could also argue, and rightly so, but you could argue, no, you should go into the book completely uh, without assumptions and just take it for what it says. That's there, there is a truth to that, no doubt. But I think that here, if you're going into it with no assumptions, you would immediately, by the time you get to verse 3, it would give you an assumption. Now, what you need to do then is take that assumption that now basically you're reading the book with an assumption. Just take it and every word, every verse, test it with gr a great deal of scrutiny. Basically, what you're doing is giving the benefit of the doubt actually to the rest of the book, destroying your assumption. You want to have a very open mind to, I might have the wrong assumption. Now, when you do that, I think often it strengthens your assumption. You're, you look for things that you wouldn't have looked for. So now with our assumption that he's talking about the kingdom gospel here and he's doing it after the mystery gospel has been given, then are we seeing that everything that he says here is national and related to the kingdom gospel. And if we can find one thing to knock that down, then maybe we would go back and say, ah, maybe Bollinger's right. And I think in doing that, we come to understand a book uh, so much, uh, so much uh, more uh, clearly. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, a, a, a related uh, question that came uh, from uh, Tony on YouTube, and uh, it says, Jude exhorts believers to contend for the faith, given the historical context. Could he specifically be referring to the Acts 15 decree? I think that, uh, uh, I, let me question the assumptions on your question, Tony, first of all. Jude exhorts believers. Yeah, that's true, but let's... Uh, Let's define what believers is he talking about. Probably these believers, again, are in that two-tiered system. They're believers in the Pauline gospel. They're believers in the Peter gospel, the John the Baptist kingdom gospel. And so the believers he's asking to contend are actually down on this level here, not on this level up here. And uh, he wants them to contend then related to Acts 15. I think he knows about Acts 15. That's part of my assumption going into it is that this is a later book. And he is uh, asking them to hold true to that gospel uh, of the circumcision that you see in Galatians chapter 2, verse 7, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me and the gospel of the circumcision to Peter. I would even be comfortable saying to Saint Peter, Peter being one of the saints. And so this gospel of the circumcision is what he wants them to earnestly contend for. Why? Because that's going to save the individual? Not at all. But because the nation is about to be destroyed and this is their last hope. 
So therefore, I would put Jude almost in the same camp as I would put Hebrews. I think Hebrews written by Paul uh, and Jude written obviously by Jude and uh, and coming from a very uh, Jewish perspective. And both of them are saying, do something now. This may be our last chance for the next 2,000 years. Better uh, take care of that uh, through there. Uh, appreciate that. Michael's got a question for us. And that uh, question uh, is, why is Paul including himself in 1 Corinthians 15, 51? He would have been changed at the rapture. Did he maybe not uh, know at this point? Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. That word we there is why Michael uh, appropriately says he's including himself. Now, uh, some would contend, most would contend, the, uh, the typical interpretation of 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and uh, 52, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the typical interpretation is that is talking about the rapture. And some would say, see, Randy, your interpretation is wrong. The typical interpretation is right because uh, Paul here includes himself in the we and the we is going to be changed at the rapture. Now, uh, in case you're not familiar with the way I teach this passage is I say all of 1 Corinthians is actually talking about the resurrection and really the resurrection of... uh, of, of the Jewish people, if you will, and the inheritance, the post-resurrection inheritance of the kingdom of God. So my interpretation is that verse 50 displays the problem of the passage. And the problem is flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But he's talking uh, to uh, members of the Jewish nation. You are supposed to inherit the kingdom of God. So we've got a problem. How is the Jewish nation going to inherit the kingdom of God? This comes into even, I think, the, uh, uh, the, the judgment of the nations in Matthew chapter 25. You know, enter into the, the, the kingdom, the inheritance that has been prepared for you. But flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. So how are they going to enter in? Well, I think Paul answers that question. He says, I tell you a mystery, verse 51. That's not the same mystery as the Pauline mystery. There's more than one mystery, and typically those of us who rightly divide the word of truth, when we talk about the mystery with no context to it, we're talking about the overarching Pauline mystery of the gospel. I don't think that's what he's talking about here. So he says, I tell you a mystery, one of many mysteries, but I tell you a mystery that... We, the nation of Israel, I think is what he's talking about here, that's going to inherit the kingdom of God. We will not all sleep, for example, at the judgment of the nations, but we shall all be changed in a moment. I like that word uh, there, by the way. The, uh, the word is atamos, atamos. We get our English word Adam, uh, and uh, it, uh, um, it means uh, indivisible. So there, there's, he says, in a moment. Uh, by the way, scientists just down the road from me here at Los Alamos proved that it should not be called an atom, but they haven't changed the name yet. I am on a campaign to change the name of an atom to something else because you you can't call it you can't call the divisible indivisible, and that's what we're doing all the time. Come on, scientists, get with it. Step up to the plate. Use some Greek grammar now. Uh, so. Uh, in, in a, in a, a tamos, in, a, in an indivisible, a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Remember that uh, this is not a, a democratic uh, campaign uh, uh, issue here, but the last trump is, you know, after the seven, and it's the trumpet then at the resurrection, uh, a, a, which comes at the second coming. It's talking about that trump. At the last trump, the trumpets will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we, the Jewish nation, shall all be changed. Now, uh, so why does Paul include himself? It's a legitimate uh, question that now I finally uh, get into here. Uh, So the question is, 
Uh, does he, or, or Michael uh, presupposes perhaps, does he not know about the rapture at this point? Uh, I am going by memory here, but I think that First and Second Thessalonians was written prior to First and Second Corinthians by quite a time. So I think that we can't say uh, that that is uh, the case. So here is Paul, including himself, I think rightly so, in the rapture, and or he's going to be in the rapture. But then he says, you know, we shall be changed in a moment. Uh, let's see if, uh, we can take a look at, uh, this again in the, uh, Greek. Um, let's see, I've lost my spot here looking at Greek. Um, the, um, it looks like, this is the uh, this this uses the we with uh, excuse me the pronoun with the plural that is uh, we individually we as a part of the nation will individually be changed in a moment now I th- I think and this is not an easy one to to lay out uh, granted but I think that we've got a situation in which. Let's take Paul and the other Jewish people who had a kingdom promise. When they receive the uh, individual salvation promise, do they forfeit their kingdom promises? I don't think so. I think that the Jew, like Paul, really has a double blessing. The Jew, like Paul, in this overlap, he was living both. I think you could even say that of Jews living today, Jews who come into the body of Christ. uh, Do they forfeit all of the kingdom promises that are theirs? I don't think so. Uh, So I think the we here is used somewhat generally of the nation of Israel. We, the nation, will not all sleep but we'll all be changed. And he has already advanced himself to the, uh, to the play, advanced himself in his explanation beyond the rapture, beyond the seven trumpets, up to the last trumpet. And he's, uh, there is a, we the nation that lives in that point uh, will, will, will be changed. But not all of us. Some of us uh, will sleep. There'll be the resurrection. And there he's using, again, a very broad we that let's take uh, Abraham and and Moses and those uh, individuals from the nation of Israel, uh, Joshua. What happens to them? They're also included in the we here. So, uh, So I think that this is one of those that in and of itself, we are unable to take this particular passage of scripture and totally build this theology. We've got to add a lot of other scriptures into it and the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But uh, then also let me grant to you, uh, Michael, that that's probably the strongest argument for this being rapture is that Paul includes himself in it. Uh, I just don't think that's a... uh, I, I, I don't think that that we has to say... I, Paul, am going to be in that resurrection. Uh, I think that uh, it does not prohibit it from saying, I, Paul, am going to receive my resurrected body at the rapture. I will already be changed. I think that my argument is not prohibited by that, though it's certainly not strengthened by that uh, either. Uh, excellent uh, observation. Thank you Through for... All of that, uh, and I believe that, uh, I'm not uh, sure, Danny, I think that uh, you have asked a question, but I am thinking that we've got the wrong passage of uh, Scripture here. Mark, uh, okay, it says Mark 8.24. Um 
the, the, the question is, uh, in Mark 8, 24, was Jesus scolding his disciples? The problem is Mark 8, 24 says he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. I'm kind of thinking that uh, it's not Mark 8, 24. Um, Corey and Nathan said, well, maybe it's uh, verse 27 here. Jesus went out and his disciples unto the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I am? Perhaps this is uh, what we're looking at on the scolding of disciples. But I tell you what, I'm going to put the question on hold and uh, let uh, Danny. Oh, well, maybe here comes uh, Danny's uh, word. Uh, uh, Let's see here. The passage is when he takes the disciples aside and curses the blind man, but the blind man is not cured the first time. Okay, we are in the right passage. Uh, So Jesus has to redo it, but he asked the blind man what he saw, and and he said, I see trees as men walking. Ah, okay. Uh, That's an an interesting uh, thought there because... uh, what, if I'm reading this correctly now, what we're saying is, uh, let's back up to verse 23. He took the blind man by the hand, led him out of town. When he had spit on his eyes, put hands upon him, he asked if he saw, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Now, who were those men? I see where you're getting here, I think. Who were those men? Those men were the disciples. And so the question is, was Jesus scolding the, the disciples? I see men as trees walking. And, and uh, Jesus didn't give this man full healing as a means of, this is the, the uh, assumption of the proposition anyway, Jesus didn't give this man full healings as a means of uh, kind of... Uh, uh, putting the disciples down a little bit or scolding the disciples. Uh, you know, no better than trees out here, like trees walking. Uh, and then from there, you go uh, straight into, let's see, uh, he put his hands upon him and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly and uh, sent him away to his home saying, neither go into town nor tell it uh, in the town. This is a period, by the way, in which uh, Jesus is Uh, on the run a little bit, and then he goes with his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, which is far outside of the jurisdiction of those who are trying to arrest him. And uh, on the way, he said, who do men say that I am? And uh, some say John the Baptist, some Elias. We had this, I believe last week, uh, one of our questions, one, capital one, of the prophets, that is the Messiah. Well, who do you say? Well, we, we agree with them. You are the Christ, is what he's saying. Uh, you know, uh, the the question, was he uh, scolding his disciples in that? I am going to say that I don't know, but uh, I think you've got, you're building a premise for why did this weird story happen? And I think that that's the right thing to do. You've got to build a premise and try to figure out, because the text itself, as you can tell, does not exactly answer the question. Now, Uh, When it doesn't answer the question, of course, the premise or the assumption we build into it might just be utterly wrong. Uh, But I think what I would do is uh, try to uh, carry that out. Danny goes on with another uh, comment and says, Jesus has the ability to cure the blind man the first time. The blind man is not cured the first time. Instead, he sees men walking as trees. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I think this is trees as being as, uh, I quote Danny, stupid, stupid men. Uh, I like the way you talk, Danny. Uh, and uh, I, so I think that, yeah, you've got uh, a good point here that that's a possibility. Again, I would, I would take that as a, an assumption. I would try to build even more into it. Is there, I would try to build my case a little stronger. Obviously, if you're going to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I don't know, of the grand jury, I don't know if you can get an indictment here. Uh, But I think that that is one of those worthy things. And so again, if I were the crime scene investigator, I would begin looking for further clues that show this is just a way to show that they are stupid, stupid men, and uh, tried to build my case there. So 
I would look and I would say, okay, is there any reference at all I can get to these uh, trees walking uh, anywhere in the scriptures? Uh, I would start uh, probably with the uh, treasury of uh, scripture knowledge. Uh, let's just uh, bring that up for, again, Mark uh, chapter 8, verse 24. Um uh, and uh, yeah, I see men as trees walking. He gives us a, a few here. Um, Thou seest the shadow of a mountain as if they were men. It'd be interesting to see, could we pull anything from that context there? I would take a little study to do it. Isaiah 29, 18, in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, the eyes of the blind will shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Any connection we could bring uh, through these passages? The eyes of them that shall see shall not be dim. The ears of them that shall see shall hearken. Uh, that's probably a... a um, a word about uh, the uh, coming kingdom, of course. Uh, now we know in part and we prophesy in part. I don't know that I necessarily would have uh, connected that one at all. Uh, but go through and uh, and try to figure out. I think that Judges 9.36 passage probably is uh, has the most hope to saying, could there be probably the Isaiah 29.18 passage? Uh, and and search uh, and, and just see, hey, can we get from this the idea that, that Jesus is, in a sense, doing this to say to the disciples, do you know how men see you right now? Uh, the, the, the Messiah is the one, you know, in a minute you're going to say, thou art the Christ. The Christ is the one, according to Isaiah 32, uh, verse 3, that uh, the eyes of them shall see shall not be dim. But your lack of faith, your lack of understanding is causing people to see me and my entourage like, you know, trees walking. Uh, they're not getting a clear view of it. And therefore, you're hindering, actually, me proving that I'm the Messiah. I think that's your line of thinking there, and I think it's I think it's worthy to uh, take. Now, let's let's assume that you can't ever prove that. Uh, does that mean it's wrong? No, it doesn't. Does that mean you should never teach it? No, it doesn't. It just means that as you do so, you should do as I do a number of times when it comes to an interpretation, and just say, it looks to me like this is what it is. Sometimes I'll say, now this is free material. You don't have to pay any extra for this because I cannot prove it. Uh, but here's my scenario. And I think that's a, a very worthy thing. Again, thanks for the close insight into that uh, particular uh, question there. Brian, on YouTube, why does the book of Daniel use the Babylonian names for Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah instead of their Hebrew names like it does for Daniel? Uh, excellent uh, question. You, those of you who have studied, of course, the uh, book of Daniel, or you, uh, you know, had a preschool Bible story book, you remember that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are uh, some of the most uh, familiar names, of course, uh, in the Bible, even outside of those who, uh, you know, go to church. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, I know them. Uh, and, of course, those are the three young men that were in the uh, fiery furnace. And uh, what do we have there? Probably Daniel chapter 1. Uh, let me uh, look. Daniel chapter 1, it looks like verse uh, 7, where you have this, uh, under, this these new names given. It says, to the princes, uh, and, and whom the princes of the eunuchs gave, gave names, uh, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belshazzar, and to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. So... Really, you've got four Hebrew young men here, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We do often take the uh, assumption that from this point on, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not called Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And that is true. But I think the premise of your question is not completely true. Uh, there is... If I recall here, there's only one time in the book of Daniel where we're going to read about these three, and that is at the fiery furnace, which I think is in Daniel chapter 3, if memory serves me correctly. And there, 
uh, in the, the very Babylonian setting where they are, where they're not bowing down to the, uh, to, to the um, uh, god of state there, Nebuchadnezzar, they're going to be thrown into the uh, fiery furnace. So you've got, in a Babylonian context, is where they're standing. Not in a Jewish context, but they're in a Babylonian context. And that's the only time we see him. So we don't have a whole lot to go by because that's in a Babylonian context. Now, the reason I mention this is it says, why does the, ba- the book of Daniel use Babylonian names for Hananel, Mishael, Mish- Mishael, and Azariah instead of their Hebrew names like it does for Daniel? I think that when it's in a Hebrew context, Daniel's Hebrew name is used. We only see Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah when they're in a Babylonian context. And Daniel wasn't there at that point for whatever reason. We don't know. It could have been, you know, he had coronavirus or something on that day and was unable to make it. Uh, so, so we don't know what would Daniel's name have been called. But here's my point. When you see Daniel in a Babylonian context, I think that his name is used. We're going to uh, check this out here. Uh, so to Daniel, he gave the name Belshazzar. And uh, let's just pull this uh, Strong's Hebrew word here. And we want to look for it. There it is in the Bible. Um, and uh, I'm going to question the assumptions on uh, what I just saw there. Uh, let's go to Daniel chapter 7, the lion's den. Um and uh, see here, I believe, no, that's not uh, Daniel chapter 7. Uh, let's see, I need to uh, find uh, where all of that is. Let's see, uh, uh, Daniel chapter 4. Let's go to Daniel chapter 4. Here we go. Uh, Daniel chapter 4. Ah, okay, that that is what I was thinking. Uh, so, Here's the reason why a, uh, a strong search doesn't always work in the book of Daniel, because parts of the book of Daniel are written in Aramaic and parts of it are written in Hebrew. And therefore, if you do a search on the Strong's Hebrew, it's not going to bring that about. Now, when you get to the Aramaic portions, okay, here's my, I'll, I'll get this. When, you, when the book of Daniel is written in Aramaic, we have these Babylonian names. Now, in Daniel chapter 4, which is Aramaic, uh, you see, but at last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belshazzar. And here in verse 9, O Belshazzar, master of the, uh, mu- ma- 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 the those things, magicians, there, I'll get that. Uh, and let me try to uh, pull up this. Okay, there we go. Uh, so Daniel what do we have? Nine times, chapter two, chapter, and all in chapter four, and then in Daniel chapter five, his name, Belshazzar, is used. And sometimes, as you see here, uh, here, here we have uh, the, the, both of them used together in verse eight, but many times as you go through, like these verses right here, uh, you see, well, there's again, Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Uh, so it is used. It is just always given us this, this, uh, footnote here. Uh, that's Daniel we're talking about, but it's in the Babylonian setting. So we're going to call his name Belshazzar. Now, the question is, if we had more about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, would it do the same? Would it say Hananiah, whose name is Shadrach? I don't know if it would or not. Obviously you don't have it there. Uh, but I think that actually his name is used. And I'm going to go with, again, when it's in the Babylonian setting, there we're going to see people calling him Belshazzar, which again is not a totally uncommon thing, uh, even in our circles. There are, you know, uh, uh, certain circles where they're going to call us different things. And I think that's uh, what we have uh, taking place there. Okay, a uh, question from uh, Jeff on YouTube. Do you believe in the law of double reference in regards to prophecy? 
Uh, this uh, law of double reference, uh, probably called by a number of different names, is the fact that uh, sometimes in prophecy you have at least what it appears to be that a prophecy is speaking about something in the short term, but its ultimate meaning is in the far, the long term, in the distant uh, future. Uh, you might get this even in uh, Isaiah chapter 7, a child will be born to us, a, a virgin will give uh, birth, and some say, you know, this is talking about the child of uh, whatever king that uh, you've got there, and uh, that that child's going to give great hope, and the government will be up on his shoulders, but ultimately it's talking about the Messiah. I think that this law of double reference, I don't know if I would call it a law. In fact, I, I think I wouldn't. I think that, you know, a law cannot be broken, if you will. And I think that it opens up a wide door to uh, making up some interpretation. I think that prophecy uh, means what it means. Now, there are types, and types always have a double reference, if you will. Uh, when you look at the type, you are not actually looking at the thing that is that is the reality. You're looking just at the imprint of it. So in types, you have double reference. But I think in prophecy, that prophecy, if we look into it closely, really is always going to uh, be assigned to... Uh, to, to that which it only means and ultimately means. What happened to my uh, uh, advertisements for the uh, retreat? Uh, uh, I know I've got one somewhere across the desk over there, uh, but uh, I just wanted to show it to you because, uh, there we go, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Psalms retreat. There, there have been a lot of people who have stumbled over the Psalms, say a Psalms 22, which is very messianic. And, uh, uh, you know, or Psalm 69, also very messianic. These are the Psalms, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they are, they're taking this law of the double reference and they're trying to put that in to say, well, this happened to David, but it really was referring to that. But the problem is they can't ever find out where that happened to David. And so I'll be teaching the Psalms and I'll be teaching them as prophecy and I will not be teaching them as, uh, you know, this happened to David, but it really was a reference to what was going to happen to the Messiah. I'm going to say, no, it's a prophecy and it was about what was going to happen to the Messiah, not what was happening to David or what would happen to David. Are there some types in the book of Psalms? I'm sure we'll find some as we do in other places in the scripture, but you know, in, in effect, my answer is no, I don't really believe in the law of double reference. I think that uh, if there is something that clearly is a double reference, then it, uh, it, it's, it's really more of a type that is being given there. But prophecy is always about what it's about. <laughs> that is, it's not about this and that, it's about that. And we're going to have to uh, try to push that foot into that glass slipper and we're going to have to butter it up first and, you know, just really uh, to try to get Cinderella to be pretty here and to be the one. And the problem is it ain't Cinderella slipper. And so we're, we're, we're stumbling in that. So Jeff, thanks for the question. Do I believe in the law of double reference in regards to prophecy? Um, I'm not convinced. I think I would disregard that law that is given there, which therefore would make it not a law, wouldn't it? Um, uh, Lori, in concluding my study on the book of James, I'm wondering if Elijah might be a picture of the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, James chapter 5, verse 17, Elijah was a man subject to life's passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It rained not on the earth a space of three years and six months. By the way, we only know it's three years and six months by the book of James. And the Old Testament just says a long time, I believe. And he prayed, and heaven gave rain, and earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, uh, uh, and uh, convert him. He goes on to... Uh, so he's giving this illustration 
in of Elijah in verses 17 and 18. So Lori says, I'm wondering if Elijah might be a picture of the time of Jacob's trouble. She used the word picture. I will go back to the word I just used a moment ago, type. Could Elijah, and especially in regard of what is happening here, Elijah with three years and six months, Could he be a reference to, let's say, the last part of the tribulation in which there is uh, uh, no rain? Could that be a type of the tribulation? I absolutely think so. I think that uh, the Jewish perspective, by the way, is of prophets like Elijah, that all of them, we call them these historical books, First and Second Kings, they call them prophetic books. They all say that, going back to this double reference thing, they all say that, for example, First and Second Kings is a double reference, not as prophecy. Sometimes I've called it implicit prophecy, but really as type. So they would go through all of that and say, that foreshadows something that is yet to come. Uh, and uh, that, that is a Jewish understanding of how to interpret scripture. That applies. Of course, James being a Jew would uh, carry that out there. And I think you see the same thing in Job's life, that Job was a type of Israel through the time of uh, trouble. And uh, so what you've got here, even in, say, the two witnesses who arise, if we put them at the last half of the tribulation, then they arise and they are the one, in verse 18, prayed again and heaven and uh, from the heaven came rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. That is to say, the time of bounty has now come. I think, I think you've got a very good case to build that particular case in Elijah, tying that over. Now, that then brings up uh, I guess what I would say is a, uh, a greater issue or a bigger issue or an exciting issue. I don't know what term I want to use there that says maybe we could go back and study the, uh, the book of Elijah or the, the book of Elijah, excuse me, the, the uh, story of Elijah, the account of Elijah and see if Elijah is not a picture of the remnant of Israel all the way through. It's a possibility. I don't know. We would have to study it, but it's worth going into with that assumption and uh, studying that. Thank you, uh, Lori, for that. Uh, and a, a question uh, from, we've got several questions uh, coming in here. Let me just say to you, by the way, before we go into Daryl's question, that uh, uh, we have uh, Dispensationalism Before Darby is our special this week at Dispensational Publishing House. And uh, by uh, William Watson, the 17th century and 18th century English apocalypticism. How's that? If you like history, this is a a, a good one. If you uh, want to be able to defend again uh, the issue of... uh, uh, of dispensationalism being new, uh, then uh, this is a, a good one. It kind of goes along with uh, this uh, book right here, Ancient Dispensational Truth. Uh, this one goes back to the early church fathers. This goes to 17th and 18th uh, century literature. But I promise you, if you go to that dirty word Amazon and try to order this, you're going to have a hard time finding it, even for its full price of $24.95. But for a few days here, you can get it 30% off right here because we got copies in hand and uh, we are sending them out to you. Brings us to Daryl's uh, question. I bought The Coming Kingdom uh, but couldn't find it on your site. Uh, uh, and that's not the question. Uh, let me. See. You know, we need to try to get some of that. The problem was that the uh, wholesaler did not have them at the price that we wouldn't lose money unless we just overcharged uh, for where you can get it elsewhere. And so that's the only reason we don't carry it, uh, just because uh, we would just lose money on every copy. Uh, so, uh, so we don't do that. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, it's, it's the way the book happens to be wholesaled on where you have to uh, get that. Uh, but what is the mother-child cult never heard of it before? The mother-child cult goes back into... Uh, somebody's uh, probably going to have to correct me on this, but uh, probably back to Sumerian days, Babylonian days, very early on anyway. Uh, and you see it in a lot of uh, not only 
ancient Near East uh, cult, cults, uh, but also even to some degree in um, uh, uh, da, 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 what am I trying to say? In um, Greek mythology uh, and um, Also, I'm having a hard time spelling there. Uh, there's one of the uh, uh, Cassiopeia, perhaps. Uh, one of the constellations that uh, has a mother-child type uh, issue in it. I think it's um, uh, Cassiopeia. I may be wrong there. Uh, now, Here's here's uh, the point. There, there is this mother-child cult that goes way back into history. There are those who want to say, well, Christianity just took that pagan concept, morphed it into their own myths and fables and legends, and made Christianity. You you could you could argue that. Uh, the problem is that going back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, you have a mother giving birth to a child who is going to be the redeemer. And so I think you've got a much better case to say biblical Christianity is about a mother-child issue, the child becoming the, the, the victor, the savior. And the reason you see it all down through history is because that was taught from the very first days of the fall of man, uh, of uh, history as we know it. And therefore, it's not surprising that the Sumerians, the uh, Babylonians, the uh, Middle Eastern cults, the, the uh, Greco-Roman cults, all of them adopted this. What they have done is morphed Christianity itself. Now, there are some other experts uh, on the child cult, uh, the mother-child cult uh, that is uh, uh, throughout uh, there, and others would be able to... Uh, express that again probably better than I am. But I think that's the reason you see it even in the constellations, for example, uh, which are a witness in the stars. We do have that book available, The Witness of the Stars by E.W. Bullinger, uh, through all of that. Okay. Uh, do we have uh, some more questions? Uh, yeah, he's working on our questions there. I uh, get uh, uh, up to uh, what is uh, next here. I've got uh, this uh, wonderful little... Uh, app that uh, Nathan has uh, made me. I don't know if I've got this on the screen where I can uh, uh, show you. Uh, and I, let's see. Uh, uh, maybe I can. You see all that. Uh, oops. Uh, sorry. I scrolled down the wrong place. But uh, all the uh, lines that go there. I can actually pop out and get a chat admin. See right there? And it pops up the next question right there, which I am going to answer. And the answer, the question is from Stephen. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, the question from Stephen is, what is the best way to quit attending a church that I have been members of for years? Take the bus, Gus, go out the door. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, no, it's a legitimate question. Uh, should I write a letter? The pastor had not done, has not done one verse by verse uh, study of the Bible in two years. Should I talk to the pastor in person? Should I tell him why I want to quit? Not a, not the easiest uh, thing that, uh, the, not the easiest question. I've got, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, I've got an article uh, yes, if you go to DuckDuckGo and search Randy White, How to Leave a Church. Uh, I do have an article on uh, Randy White Ministries, How to Leave a Church, um, and talks about, you know, whether you should leave a church and uh, leaving, uh, being, uh, going through there. I do recommend typically visiting the pastor, visiting your friends, uh, but find that article for for a, something that's a little deeper. But now let me just uh, speak uh, away from that article, and that article is probably four or five years old now, uh, and I don't remember exactly what it says. But let me go ahead and answer the question here verbally. 
Uh, what's the best way to quit attending a church I've been a member of? So I'm assuming you've already decided, I've, I've got to go. Uh, and there are a number of reasons that, of course, you have decided that. Let me first of all say, as my dad originally said uh, from his own experience, that as tough as this is, the harder thing is finding the next church. You're going to find that leaving the church turned out to be an easy thing to finding the next church. It's going to be very, very difficult. So leave a church when you have to. And I think that more and more today, you have to. Uh, so I'm going to assume everything is right on all the reasons why you need to uh, leave the church. Now, what should you do? I think that in some degree, it depends a little bit on the church. Uh, if you are a member of my church, for example, and you decided, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to leave. Well, we would know it. Uh, so you just as well come visit with me. I mean, you know, we're a very small church and, uh, you know, I'm going to realize, hey, you hadn't been there in three weeks. You know, what's up uh, with Stephen? And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to put it all together and uh, I'll call you up. And it would be very awkward not to to, I mean, you just as well have the conversation because somebody's going to have the conversation. And besides that, small family, you know, the, the church family, you you told somebody probably, and uh, somebody's going to tell somebody and somebody's going to know. Now, if you're in a church of 10,000, uh, the pastor doesn't know you anyway. And I honestly don't know why you got into church to begin with, but uh, I suppose it was all good reasons as well. But, you know, probably you could just walk out and probably, uh, unless they watch giving records, they're never going to come back after you. They're going to—you'll—you'll you'll be on the mailing list from now till um, uh, after the rapture, I suppose, because it'll keep going. <laughs> uh, but what you've—I—I I, I do think that in a normal kind of church setting, if you've got a church of under, I don't know, I pastored a church of 2,500 members, and I pretty much know who knew who in that church who was coming and going. So I'd say if you're under, you know, that uh, 2,500 member mark or so, yeah, make an appointment with the pastor. Say, pastor, uh, you know, you probably sense that I am, I've not been as uh, faithful or as supportive. I am going to be leaving the church. I don't wish you any ill. I just wish you would uh, teach some verse-by-verse Bible teaching. It's what I'm looking for. I think our church is suffering uh, from all of that. I'm uncomfortable supporting now the kind of preaching and teaching that's going on. So I'm not going to go out blabbing all over the place. And when I see you in the grocery store, I'm going to say hello and God bless you. And uh, we can have a a, a, you know, a good cordial relationship out, out of there, but I just want you to know. I think in normal situations, that's what you uh, need to do and uh, let him know that. Now, if he's not interested in that, then I guess, you know, it's his loss uh, and uh, you don't have to tell him in that uh, regard. Uh, but if you've got any kind of relationship at all, if he knows your name, let's go with that. Does he know your name? If he knows your name, then try to try to see him. Drop in, make an appointment, whatever it is, uh, and uh, try to see your pastor and let him know. I think is the uh, the the good thing to do. From uh, Ricky on YouTube, what is exactly what exactly is democratic socialism that Bernie Sanders uh, promotes? It's Marxism. That's exactly what it is. Uh, what do they say it is and how do you actually see it? Well, I told you how I actually see it. It's Marxism. Uh, Bernie's been a communist since his earliest days. You know, he, he uh, honeymooned in the Soviet Union singing uh, Woody Guthrie songs uh, to the Soviets there. Woody Guthrie, of course, was a uh, famous communist from Pampa, Texas, where I used to be the pastor. Uh, and, uh, you know, this land is your land, this land is my land. That's Bernie's song. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, I, the, the, the part of the question I can't answer is how do they say it is and what do you actually uh, see it? I, I can tell you, I think that I saw a pretty good meme. I'm not sure I, I should nor could fully explain it, but you've seen the little uh, poop emojis. 
Uh, and uh, what it uh, showed is one side had the poop emoji and it said uh, socialism. The other side had the poop emoji with some candy sprinkles on it and it said democratic socialism. So that's the difference. One of them has um, sugar sprinkles on it. Makes you feel a little better that there's some democratic process to it that you can elect your socialist. My guess is when you go to a, uh, a communist nation, you're going to find that uh, they have elections and the people elect their leaders. Uh, it's democratic socialism is what they would call it. I just don't know that there's much difference. Now, Furthermore, let's suppose that democratic socialism means we get to select our representatives. Uh, nonetheless, uh, who cares whether I elect my representative who's going to lead me to hunger and destruction or I don't elect my representative who's going to lead me to hunger and destruction. Either way, I'm going to hunger and destruction. So, you know, you make me feel better because I got to elect you? Uh, it doesn't make me feel, it doesn't put food on the table. And neither kind of socialism, no kind of socialism puts food on the table. It just simply does not work with the human spirit as the human spirit is. It is, democratic socialism is still based upon that Marxist principle to each according to his need from each according to his ability. And that is a, fundamentally flawed worldview that is not going to work. So difference, I don't think there uh, is a uh, difference uh, in all of that. Lots of questions today because we were off yesterday and we're going to go ahead and uh, take the uh, questions that uh, we've, uh, the ones we've got here. I think we got three or two, two or three more uh, here. Uh, let's uh, look to Nehemiah chapter four, verse four. Uh, and uh, this question comes from, I didn't catch, uh, it's from Stephen. Uh, Nehemiah 4, 4, is Nehemiah praying to, Sa uh, is Nehemiah praying or is Sanballat and Tobiah, uh, Sanballat or Tobiah uh, praying? Does Bollinger agree with your answer? Well, he's dead, so he can't uh, speak to it, right? <laughs> but uh, let's see what it says. Hear, O God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon our head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. Okay, now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him. We're just going to have to keep backing up here a little bit. Uh, and I am going to, it, it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded, we there is, I'm going to assume we is uh, Nehemiah. We builded the wall. He was wroth. This is why I use King James. Every now and then you get a word that is just so much fun to say. He was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. This is Sanballat. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end of the day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? He's mocking them, as you can tell. Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, even that which they build, if a fox were to go up, he shall even break down the stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey to the land of captivity and uh, give them for a prey in the land of captivity Cover not their iniquity, let not thy, their sin be blotted out from before thee. So we built the wall. That, excellent question here. Who is speaking? Uh, first of all, I don't uh, trust this, but in Logos, for those of you who are reading this, I believe if you click those three dots and open up the resource, you can click address labels. I don't like them, uh, but you can uh, click address labels and... Uh, see who is speaking, uh, and uh, here they say Sanballat, but that's in verse 3, um, and uh, goes on. Okay, let's check New American Standard here, see how they put it. Um, in verse 3, Tobiah, uh, here the quotes, they've got a quote mark, and ending a quote mark, and then they do not have a quote mark here, but clearly somebody is talking here. 
Uh, that tells me they punted on it. They weren't sure what to do with that. Let's go to the ESV. And uh, they also do not have a quote, so we built the wall. Uh, looks to me like because they do not have the quote, they're typically putting the we here with this prayer. I think that it honestly, we'll check Bollinger here in just a moment. I think that it could go either way. It could be a mocking prayer in which, uh, coming across the page uh, here again to the right, uh, Tobiah is cont- the Ammonite. You know, if a, if a fox go up, he shall break down their wall. Hear, O oh our God. This is Tobiah speaking. We are despised. Turn the Jews' reproach upon their own head. Give them for a prey in the land of captivity. You know, just let them go back. And cover not their iniquity, those sinful Jews. And let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Now, uh, that could be Tobiah, or it could be we, Jeremiah, comes in and begins uh, to pray that. I, um, I, I, if I was teaching the book of Nehemiah verse by verse, I would build a case by this. Because I'm just doing Ask the Theologian, I'm going to uh, say my speculation is you can go either way on it and build a case uh, for it. Now, uh, uh, Bollinger on the left side of your screen, he says it's Nehemiah's prayer. Uh, It's a figure of speech, apostrophe, appendix six, um, which, uh, I was seeing if the apostrophe figure pulls up there. You could could pull that up and uh, see there. Uh, Nehemiah's prayer, he says it's an echo of these particular prayers in the Psalms in accord with that dispensation. My guess is these are what you call the imprecatory prayers. Um, I think that just because this prayer here in verses 4 and 5 does echo the imprecatory prayers and is in accord with that dispensation doesn't mean that it's Nehemiah's prayer. I think it could be a misused prayer by uh, Sanballat or Tobiah and uh, carry that out. So uh, Bullinger seems to be convinced it's Nehemiah's prayer. I mean, that's what he wrote, Nehemiah's prayer. Uh, he, he might have a good point. Uh, we would ha- It's a little bit of an argument from silence. Do Sanballat and Tobiah ever pray? What is Sanballat and Tobiah's religion? Uh, they might be Samaritans, which is kind of this pseudo-Jewish religion, and therefore for them to pray in a Jewish context like that wouldn't be uh, all that unusual. Uh, so my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think you could go either way. Again, if I was teaching the book of Nehemiah, I would probably try to build a case one direction or another, uh, in, uh, that, uh, thank you for that. Okay. What else, uh, have we got here? Uh, we have, uh, did we get them all? Uh, Okay. Uh, I was uh, thinking that I had uh, seen one other. Did I see one about the Baptist uh, thing uh, going on? Or uh, did I just imagine uh, that uh, happening? Uh, Okay. Uh, Maybe it was just in a comment that uh, was there. Uh, But you can ask that question tomorrow if you'd like. How's that? so glad that uh, each one of you have joined us once again. A, uh, a, a, this is a hard-to-get book right now, and uh, we've got them. Dispensationalism Before Darby, 30% off. It's $24.95 regular. Use coupon code WEDNESDAY. I do hope you'll uh, go to our website as well and click the retreat button and uh, look at this uh, uh, issue right here for our Psalms retreat. Uh, The 6th Annual Bible Conference Retreat in Branson, Missouri over Labor Day weekend, September 4th through the 7th. This year would be a delight to have you. We'll be back tomorrow morning and all through the rest of the week on Ask the Theologian, and as well as having our uh, John broadcast on Wednesday night and Galatians on Thursday night. Always a blessing to have you. Thanks for sticking around a little extra. Made up for some lost time yesterday. And uh, thanks for uh, using the uh, chat box, too. That helps us. Uh, God bless you. We shall see you tomorrow. RandyWhiteMinistries.org. Until then, question the assumptions.